Nina, it's really good to see you again. Hello, Sergio. Good to be back. Thank you for having me. It's always, always a pleasure. And we have a lot of news, as always. I'll tell you, the first thing I want to do is is move or speed by the open AI drama. I think we talk too much about this thing. And I hope they're not that important in our lives. What do you think? Oh, that it remains to be seen. I think open AI are important to our lives because they have brought JetGPT to the world. And so, want it or not, they have an impact. True. But let's not hang up on this one person, but just like focus on the whole landscape. There's so much more happening and to be talked about. Yes. And how much of the landscape wouldn't be there if he had not made that much noise? in terms of the safety summit, because we saw the threat to our very existence in terms of the, uh, you know, the whole section on, on foundation models within the AI Act. So I hope we can find the future without whatever some Altman brought into our heads. But yeah, let's move on. What do we have? So if we look at e-privacy or at fines and the impact of regulation, what is your favorite piece of news? Oh, the dark parents in Spain. Starting with Spain is always entertaining because there's no lack of, of fines, right? There's fines every week. Everywhere. It's never going to disappoint. Ones. They're very tiny, tiny. Yeah, we discussed that once. And we have one on, on dark patterns. You're right. And the the idea here is that it's never happened before. I think that's the most important element. We never had a fine on dark patterns in Spain. And the paradox of it is that it was imposed on a lawyer's website. You know, it's like a directory for lawyers. Hmm. To ask for or not ask really for consent, but to nudge people into acceptance. Yeah, yeah. The idea is that he was hiding that, that list of vendors. Well, they had a list of vendors, a long list of, not vendors, they had a long list of companies that would receive people's personal data hiding deep in the, in the privacy notice. And it reminded me of the TikTok fine in Ireland, mm. 300 whatever. 340 million something. Thank you. Something yeah. like that, right? So that large fine, it had gone through the EDPB, as it happened with Meta as well. So the EDPB, you know, had to review what the DPC was going to do about, about TikTok because it affected so many countries. And one of the German DPAs also had a say in that final fine. And specifically, they had a say on the dark patterns side. And for the first time, something that, that I saw there is that they associated dark patterns with a breach of Article 5, this was it, of the GDPR, specifically of the fairness principle. So the German DPA, and then as a consequence, the EDPB, and then as a consequence, the Irish TPC said that if you use dark patterns, you are in breach of the Article 5. Article 5 and the Fairness Principle. So there you are. We may see more of that. I hope so, because uh, that's exactly what it is. And in the Spanish case, I think you told me that, that from next year on, um, the accept or reject needs to be on the first day, uh, mandatory for everybody. Um, I wonder, though, like what is going to happen then with the Spanish authorities, how they're going to enforce this. Now they they must be incredibly busy with all the small fines they are issuing. And like, I, I wonder how um, how they can yeah. accomplish this. It's out of control. I agree with you. If they already last time we last time I, I was in a room with the the Spanish, uh, the director of the AEPD. She was making it clear they're overstretched, and everybody knows that. They're, they do so much with the resources they have. The problem is, if you are committed to answering you know, to every single claim, and now you expand the range of 
potential fines by making it clear that as of, in this case, January 11th, a reject all should be there on first layer. It's, I'm happy with that. It's consistent with the real definition of consent. The problem is that now that very requirement of consent is being expanded. And I believe it's being expanded in an artificial way. I don't know if you saw there was a, the EDPB just released guidelines on the concept of gaining access to a computer and other technical details of the e-privacy directive. I do not agree with a lot of what they say, but they're expanding the concept of gaining access to a computer to even URL variables, not because they identify you uniquely, but simply because they occupy some of your RAM or whatever they argue in there, I can't remember, but it's really going so, so expensive that at that point, you're going to have a scenario that is completely unenforceable, if you ask me, because nobody can comply. Yeah, I think it is a lot more important to create more awareness among the people, among the users, the consumers, um, who really need to know what they are consenting to or not. Um, just accepting all because it's uh, uh, for convenience. Um, I've had this discussion last Thursday in my LinkedIn Live session with Kat Patel. Mm. And he said, even though he's aware of all of this, just out of convenience and because he needs quick information or access to something, he quick he clicks accept all many times, uh, even though he knows what is going to happen and it's not always beneficial for him. So we need more um, transparent choice. And this can easily be done by just not putting any, just the, the legal text, the legal copy that no one understands and reads and it doesn't give you enough guidance on what, but clear, plain language that offers you like, okay, this is my choice. And then seeing the consequences, it's not, sometimes you, you reject all and then the whole website isn't usable anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the end, people are not going to read anything. As you're saying, legalese is, is complex. So in the end, it means that people only see the choice. And if we only see the choice, that means that we are really in a, in a race to the bottom. Because in the end, it doesn't matter how intrusive it is. I'm going to ask you anyway. And you're going to say no or yes. Anyhow, anyhow, you will make no distinction because I have no way to make it very clear to you that what I'm doing is far less intrusive than what any other website may be doing, but you have no way to know because if I want you to know how less intrusive I am, I need to bore you with my legalese. So I don't know. We'll see. I think it's it's a never ending story. It is a never ending story, but it's also here touching upon two very important points. It is very closely related to accountability and responsibility because um, as a company that has an interest to to care for, say, um, yeah. their shoppers or their customers, um, the visitors to their website, if you are genuine about this, um, you have the responsibility to offer uh, a place where it is possible where you respect your customers. Um, so basic ethical values that you can install to guide your way to make a decision um, in, in how you want to, um, to in, in what way you want to offer cookies and, and trackers and how you want to uh, ask your customers for consent. Um, and I think you'd be surprised how many times people say yes, not only out of convenience, but also because they have, they trust you and they have a genuine interest to keep your, uh, to, to find the articles, the items, the products that they are looking for quickly and easily. And if cookies help them to do this and they do, yeah, boom, there you go. So why do I need to ask you up front if I can do things without any non-exempted cookies? Why do I need to start throwing everything at you measuring everything about you that I still don't need instead of going gradually, you know. If you think the cookie banner, sorry if I have to jump in there, is partly um, responsible for the tracking because they it enabled um, uh, companies to track 
from the first minute people have their website on. <laughs> exactly. It's a carte blanche to start tracking everybody from the first minute. Whereas if you do things gradually, you know, I was interviewing Ariel Garcia last week. I saw her. I haven't listened to it yet. It's on my list. She was, she's brilliant. And, and something resonated, which is why do we need to know everything about our customers the very first time we meet them? That's not how relationships are built. First, I may know your name and some basic stuff about you, and then the relationship develops. And as you browse through the website, you come back and there's more trust, then you give me more because I can give you more in return. Anyway, Nina, I know we always end up with this one. Let's let's move let's on. Move let's on. please move yeah. on. What's your second favorite piece of news? <laughs> Uh, the case of um, a DNA analysis company um, called 23andMe uh, that offers, um, you know, that highly popular thing you um, you send in DNA sample, and then uh, they uh, uh, they track you and connect you to whoever you are related to in the world. Um, to help you find relatives that you didn't even know you had. Um, and uh, then had a data breach. And um, a list was published. I think thousands of people were on that list, identifying them as Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and that was uh, that list was published on the dark web. Outrageous. How can a company have such lux privacy and safety standards for such sensitive data and dealing with such highly personal information. It's tricky. I was thinking that in the clinical trials space, because we interviewed the DPEO from from a very well-known hospital group in, in Spain a few months ago, and in clinical trials, you've got DNA data you've got encryption, you've got all of this stuff, but there is a piece that is missing, which is the key element of risk from my point of view, which is the customer. But if you want to succeed in a consumer business, again, like this one, VC packed, it needs to grow fast. It needs to ensure that people, once they spit on whichever tube they, they spit on, they can log on into a portal, with a password and create another password, whatever else they add. Maybe this, I mean, I'm sure there's now two factor authentication in there. I haven't checked it, but this, you know, hackers are always going to be two steps ahead of you. And in the end, you're going to have to push that inconvenience for consumers. Whereas in a hospital, it never happens because it's researchers and they have their VPNs and their portals and there isn't the same risk. And it's not accessible. It's only accessible to a very small amount of people. My question in relation to this, um, and this is what I stumbled upon when I first read this, is it really necessary to have a platform that is open to everybody who signed up for this and, and who um, requested their DNA? You want to know where you come from. So what's enticing here is that you drag more people and it's a sort, a sort of Facebook on steroids. The more people do the test, the more valuable it is because the only way it knows who your cousin might, might be or your related, your sort of remote, distant relative might be is that they find connections in the DNA. So you need a lot of people to do it. And the more they add in a sort of dynamic way it starts telling you more and more about where you may be from maybe there's a huge problem at the core of the business model <laughs> i'm thinking uh, i i think you are not wrong but that's my personal um opinion um and, and for two reasons one is that um you have to ask your consent for all the family and relatives that you already know to give your DNA because it will also give a part of you will also give a part of their DNA to such an institute. Do they want this? What what are the consequences, especially in this data breach? It's not always, and you don't know. Maybe some relatives you don't know so well. Maybe they have done things in the past they're not so happy about. 
and um, relationships that they'd rather forget about or you never know. And the second thing I'd heard that that these agencies, these companies um, who make a profit are comparably inaccurate. Yeah. You know, something that could be interesting is that in, in the U.S., 40 states are suing Meta. And what they are saying is that Instagram and, and Facebook, they have an impact on mental health of young people. Uh, I haven't looked at it, but it's super interesting. Um, 40 out of 50 and um, within the states um, is, yes, it's it's really bad news for Meta. Um, on top of everything that hasn't been going well for Meta, I think of the subscription model um, that hasn't been well received. I mean, like asking people for like, okay, respecting your privacy or pay. I don't know how long that will be around or keep it up. Um, it's a it's a huge business. Reels started recently to copy, of course, TikTok, and it's really a huge business in itself you know and it's gaining importance in social commerce yeah so it's it's instagram it's a huge thing and yet i really think they could totally disconnect it in europe but if the us has a problem like this and this they call this thing it's a tobacco really level kind of lawsuit and they talk about this concept which i like which is dopamine manipulating features dopamine manipulating features because of how hooked you may be yeah right? but By... we've all been there and and i mean and then imagine how terrible it must be for for kids and and teenagers who have um uh, a lot lower uh um, threshold for self-control um or at least in most adults they have that um but um we've all been there scrolling doom I mean, we're on LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn is pure That's dopamine. True, true. Yeah, LinkedIn. You know? <laughs> like, oh, let me check this. Oh, what's this news article? Oh, oh. So, um, I do think it is um, it is important um, to look at that more closely and uh, to find a better way, and not um, allowing Instagram um, to to do as they please, but, you know, to have some sort of regulation um, on top of that, not only for Instagram or, or any meta product, but uh, true for any social platform. Nina, we had a lot. We always leave a lot of stuff on the plate. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me, Sergio. Great pleasure. I look forward to the next one. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.